Each week on Victory Garden's Edible Feast, the James Beard Award-winning filmmakers behind the perennial plate tell stories about sustainable food and gardening across America. This week we'll be visiting New York City, where we'll watch salt water evaporate into crystals and we'll forage for mushrooms in city parks. Then we'll learn a few gardening tips from farms with a view to die for, and end with a couple recipes from Enat Admoni of Balabusta Restaurant and Cookbook. That's coming up next on the Victory Gardens Edible Feast. Welcome to the Victory Gardens Edible Feast, a journey across the edible American landscape, where we explore stories about food and gardening around the country. Narrated by me, Daniel Klein, filmmaker and chef of the Perennial Plate. There are so many iconic stories, one-of-a-kind places, delicious foods, and inspiring people in New York that we aren't even going to bring them up. Instead, we're going to dive right into this episode and add to the pantheon of stories that make this place so special. We begin with a chef from Arizona who moved to the Big Apple and started making salt. Sarah Sprawl literally collects ocean water from Long Island and solar evaporates it to make a cook's most essential ingredient. So basically what salt making is all about is exposing salt water to the sun and the wind. If you're not gonna cook the salt, you have to evaporate it in some way. So I do 100% solar evaporation, which means no electricity is used. So I needed an outdoor space to make the salt happen. I actually remember the moment that I thought about making salt. I was volunteering at the Green Market twice a week in Union Square and I was making friends with all these awesome farmers and you know these green ingredients from upstate and Long Island and New Jersey and I would cook these dishes and start to season with salt from you know the corner store and I said why, why are these potatoes grown by you know uh, rich at Lucky Dog and this butter is from Millport Dairy and the salt is from who knows where so I was basically just solving a problem in the local food community and then it just kind of snowballed from there. All right, so I'm just scraping the salt out of here. As you'll see, it's, it's a little bit damp still, which is fine. It comes off the pan easier. And it's a little bit gray just because of the moisture. And then once it sun bakes on this clay tray, it's going to whiten up to match the other salts. Um, a lot of salt companies will actually use something called an anti-caking agent, which is a chemical that keeps salt from absorbing moisture. Um, and I wanted to, you know, keep my salt as natural as possible, so that's how I kind of came up with the clay tray, because I also didn't want to use electricity. Um, not because I'm a hippie, but because there's no electricity up here. <laughs> so I was kind of trying to work with what I got, and um, it, it worked out that it all just, you know, the entire process is is uh, eco-friendly, I guess you would say. It's okay if you're a hippie. Yeah, I'm like, you know what? I, got, I, I guess I'll just be proud of it because I guess I am. <laughs> My first experience was renting a car with a friend, a zip car, and buying a five gallon bucket from Home Depot and we just headed to whatever beach we could find. And it took six weeks indoors. So we're like, okay, well it works, but how do we make this better? It was also a progression of making the ingredient better. And so it was all about connections with the green market. I approached fishermen at the green market. Two of the fisheries thought it was crazy. And so I moved on to the third. <laughs> and they're crazy as well. So they took me up on the offer. They said, you know, OK, well, when we're 30 miles east of Montauk, when we're fishing, we'll get water for you. Because they said, it has to be better out there. You're bringing in the best fish to the market. And I want the best water. And obviously, the best fish live in the best water. So I did that for about a year and a half. And then with this whole expansion in Long Island, I did get like using rights for an aquifer on the south shore of Long Island. So it's basically, if you imagine uh, like a splice of the earth, 200 feet down below sand, silt, and clay, there's a aquifer of salt water below the freshwater table in Long Island. And basically the well taps into that. So it's, the water's probably been untouched for multiple years while it's being slowly filtered naturally. 
All right, so basically, like, in each of these pools, it's, like, represented, like, different stages of um, salt making. So basically, you saw the water back there. It looks, it looks like fresh water. You know, it just got gravity fed into the pools. Here, uh, the water looks a little bit darker. It's because it's turning into a brine. And you can see a little bit, like, the, the stuff on top that moves. That's floor to cell. So, like, the, the salt is evaporating so much that it's forming a crust on the top called floor to cell uh, and then when it gets heavy enough it actually sinks and becomes this so the salt is actually forming right now and then the water on top here will evaporate a little bit more so each pool harvests roughly seven pounds of salt and I have eventually I'll have 144 pools in here like I, I'm not doing anything crazy here I'm actually just letting nature kind of take its course I'm encouraging it so we're supposed to be picking up salt with our hands and seasoning our food. We're not supposed to be picking up a bag and opening it and just eating what companies tell us we should be eating so that they can have their potato chips on the shelf for nine months and have them be okay. That is not healthy for us, you know? And you could get calcium, you could get magnesium, you can get like up to 80 different trace minerals just from seasoning your food correctly with good salt. People are so educated about where their kale comes from, but they're not asking about the one ingredient that goes in every single dish that you'll cook or eat during the day. We'll now travel down from the rooftops and venture into the parks. All around us are weeds and mushrooms, berries and leaves that can be eaten straight from the wild even if the wild is New York City. Meet Ava Chin, the urban forager. I grew up in a big apartment building and I didn't have access to a garden. So for me, nature was the weeds that I saw in the parks and the playgrounds of my youth. Um, and what was so thrilling was later finding out that a lot of those same weeds were actually edible and medicinal and had a culinary history in other parts of the world. So in the city you find wild weeds that are edible that are growing even in the cracks in the pavement. I wouldn't necessarily eat from these areas, but if the apocalypse came, yes. I had you at CSI. Oh, okay, hi, I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> Former student. Um, so uh, this is actually, this is uh, amaranth. It's also known as pigweed. It is not in a great state right now. Um, and again, I wouldn't necessarily eat from this area, uh, but if necessary. It's really been an amazing journey that's enabled me to see my hometown in a totally different light. I think when people think New York City, they think concrete jungle, they think Wall Street, they think advertising, they think basically work. The last thing they think is food and nature. But in fact, the edible weeds are all around us. Here we have plantain. Uh, it came over with the colonists. Native Americans called it white man's foot because wherever the colonists settled, the plantain sprang up. Um, down around over there, we have mugwort, which is a great plant, a medicinal plant. Some people say that it intensifies your dreams. We also have a plant called lady's thumb that's right over there. And we also have wood sorrel which is that clover-like plant right over there. As human beings through the centuries, we've tended to breed for benign flavor and sweetness. And one of the great things about foraging is that you find a whole abundance of different types of flavors. Lots of things that are considered kind of bitter, like dandelion greens are considered kind of bitter, but that bitter component to the dandelions is actually an indication that they're high in phytonutrients and they're actually better for you than some of the domesticated relatives two dandelions that you find in the markets. So that's one of the reasons why I, I love foraging. I feel like I can 
get some of those wild nutrients back and put it on our dinner table and serve it up to the family. Um, and my kid gets those nutrients that she wouldn't ordinarily get um, even from the, if we, from the best markets. This is pokeweed. Do you guys know this plant? This is a native plant, it's native to the Americas. It is both a food as well as a medicine and a poison, depending on what time of year and what stage you get the plant in. So in its very earliest shoots, it's actually edible if you boil it a couple of times. In the South, they call it poke salad. But if you get it too far in its stage of growth, it actually um, is poison. Look at that. Hello, mama. This is a gorgeous chicken of the woods mushroom. You see chicken of the woods right around this time of year throughout the summer and then through the early part of the fall growing at the base of trees. This chicken is gorgeous. Poison ivy is not going to stop us. Uh, I'm still going to collect this mushroom. <laughs> I hate to say it, but they do still smell like Japanese schoolgirl erasers to me. Mmm, <laughs> and just fresh. They smell like the woods. Ugh, I'm in heaven. I'm so happy that we found these. You know, the land is the original, that's the provider, that's the original supermarket. I think for most people they think that it's unusual that it's in New York City, but for me this is my home, you know, and so why wouldn't I want to forage here? You know, the concept of the city as a concrete jungle I think is a really limited one. I mean, as you can see, we, you know, we don't have to go more than a couple of yards in order to find really good quality food. Now we're going to talk about technique, specifically kitchen gardening and kitchen cooking. A common theme in this episode is rooftops, and thanks to innovative gardeners and farmers, they are now a great place to grow vegetables. We're going to learn carrot thinning, microgreen planting, and pollinators from two Brooklyn farms, the Brooklyn Grange and Eagle Street Rooftop Farm. We have a continuous green roof system that covers basically the, the whole roof, which is 65,000 square feet, and on it we grow and we sell vegetables. We have chard, kale, a lot of tomatoes, a lot of peppers, and then also quite a lot of mixed greens. These are microgreens in that we harvest them as baby leaves. These plants never get taken outside or they never get up to their full potential, but that's kind of a, a niche market that allows us to utilize this, this greenhouse all through the summer. So literally what we would do is just come through and, we, and we, we harvest them like this and use them for these small leaves. And these microgreens have a lot of flavor and also a lot of nutrient in them. For the sake of the radishes that we'll do today, um, it's important that we get the tray, you know, at least three quarters of the way full with the, with the potting mix. So we'll get the soil in there nice and, nice and big. We'll, we'll spread it out evenly amongst the whole tray. Sometimes you can do a little shake like this to, to get it uh, uniform in there. You can take out the big clumps. Then you get your seed. I know with radishes that we use two, uh, two level tablespoons. So I take one, two. It takes a little bit of practice, but if you take a nice pinch full and you just get into a nice, a nice rhythm and you really want to get the seeds in there pretty tight, if you get them too tight, then you run into some problems. We'll go ahead and, uh, and sprinkle some radish seed in here, something like that. A lot of folks will come through and, and, and put a light press on this just to sink the seed in a little bit. And when I say lightly, I, I, uh, I barely I barely push it in there. I don't want to pack it down too hard. The important thing with watering is a nice, gentle, soft watering. 
and you want to stand pretty far back from the tray. You really want to get a nice soaking initially. And that's that. These seeds will pop within a couple days. You could even take a pot like this, a, uh, you know, a five inch or a four inch pot fill it with potting soil and practice this way at home and just stick it on your window. So if you get southern exposure and quite a bit of it, you can impress your guest with a little garnish or uh, a nice little micro salad at times. I do know a lot of people experiment with that at, at home. Uh, the whole concept of thinning a carrot bed would be to uh, allow each one of these carrots to, to have a little bit more space to grow. If these guys are growing like this next to each other, that's when you find that you, you ever see carrots that are like wrapped around each other and stuff. So they're fighting for the same little bit of nutrient that they have down at the base. It's much better to space them out a little bit more so that you can get proper growth. So you'll see like, you know, these five carrots or six carrots right here, like these two aren't going to grow very well next to each other. So ideally you'd come out and, and, and pluck one of the smaller ones to give this guy a little bit of room to grow. And you could even pluck this one. That way they get a, you know, a good inch or so apart from each other. We'll come through and we'll pluck like every other one or every three or something. Just come through like, like so. Get one there, get one there. You just work your way down the bed. You know, after you harvest 15 or 20 pounds of carrots, you thin, you thin the bed as you go too. So this garden purposefully has a bunch of pollinator friendly plants. They bloom at different times of year, which is also important because, you know, pollinators don't all come at once. Um, so in the fall, we have the torch dithonia, which is great for the migrating monarch butterfly. We have sunflowers, which are great for the bumblebees. Um, earlier in the spring, we had chamomile, which is very attractive to aphids, which is very attractive to ladybug larvae. And ladybugs are crucial in pest management for gardens. So rather than releasing ladybugs or using a spray to kill aphids, we just planted a plant that attracted the aphids as a food source. The ladybugs found out about that food source, and just like New Yorkers crowding in on a cool new restaurant, all the ladybugs came and visited to eat all the aphids off the chamomile. And then when they were cleaned of aphids, I could harvest the chamomile as a tea. So we have, uh, we have growing over here um, a bunch of plants. Hey friend, high five. This is a beautiful little bumblebee. Bumblebees are actually super important pollinators. The bumblebee vibrates at a different rate than honeybees do, and so the bumblebee vibration is the perfect speed to dislodge pollen in cherry tomatoes, for example. So you see honeybees and you see bumblebees all over the garden, but you don't even think about the fact that pollen, you know, it's, it's a grain, it's this little nugget. And for it to get dislodged, like sometimes it falls off on um, a monarch butterfly's wing, sometimes it gets dislodged by a bumblebee, and that just depends on the frequency with which they move. So in order for fruits to get successfully pollinated, I need not just one creature, like a honeybee, I need a whole cornucopia of them. But we also have plants that don't serve any purpose directly. I don't eat torch tithonia, but this Mexican sunflower, torch tithonia, is really attractive to the bees. It, because there are so many flowers here, this bee will sit on this plant for like 20 minutes and just hang out and keep hanging out. Um, so compound flowers like this are really, really good for attracting insects, which of course helps me because I have a dozen cherry tomato plants that I'd really like to get pollinated. So when you're done there, please go to the cherry tomatoes. <laughs> Finally, we get to what this growing is all about, eating. Enad Admoni of Balabusta Restaurant and Cookbook cooks up two elegant and simple eggplant dishes and a braised fish. My name is Enad Admoni. I'm uh, the chef and owner of Taim Falafel, uh, Balabusta Restaurant in Barbara Nath in the West Village. I'm known for my Mediterranean cuisine and Middle Eastern. Today I will show you a Moroccan fish. It's spicy. We're going to use salmon. We're also going to do two different kinds of eggplant. We're going to do one with tahini sauce and herb salad. And the other one going to be very fresh, cold salad on top of heirloom tomato. So there is many ways to do eggplant. The best way actually is open flame. The other option is to cut the eggplant to half, wrap it in aluminum foil, put its skin down on a saute pan with high temperature, high flame. But there is other ways you can put it on a high temperature in the oven. I have the specific things I imported all the way from Israel. Until the eggplant is going to be ready, I'm going to start with the fish. 
I use usually grouper, today we use salmon. I seared it before, you put the skin down, you season it with tiny salt, and that's it, flip it, don't even need to cook because it's gonna cook in the sauce. The sauce I start with quarter cup of canola oil, and then like five to seven garlic cloves thin sliced. So I cook it in the oil, and then we'll put one jalapeno slice, thin slice, and one spoon of arisa. Sweet paprika, the spicy hot paprika. I will mix it very good and now the sauce is getting thicker. So you put a little bit of salt, then we're gonna add the tomato. I ground the tomato before so it's smooth. When the sauce is ready and you taste it, you put the salmon inside, skin up because you see how it's so beautiful before, and let it cook. You can cover it. And that's it. Seven to ten minutes, it's, it's ready. And cilantro, you finish this one with a lot of cilantro. So as Israeli, we grew up with a lot of eggplant and many different kind of recipes. My first uh, eggplant is eggplant with herb salad on top. So I'm gonna show you how to do a great tahini sauce. And it's really, really great for you. Raw sesame paste a little bit of ground black pepper, half tablespoon of salt, lemon juice. I like my tahini very lemony and cold water. You want to have some thickness into it. So now I'm gonna put it in the fridge just to get a little bit thicker so it will be easy to spread it. And now we're gonna make our herb salad, sliced mint, sliced parsley, and cilantro. We're gonna put all of them together here. Some fresno chili. A little bit salt. We're gonna check our eggplant. Just be sure that the whole eggplant is really soft. Take this beautiful eggplant, slide it here. I just score it in the middle and open like a boat. Now we're going to get a tahini we made earlier. Just going to drizzle on top. A little bit lemon, a little bit olive oil. Okay. And then we're going to drizzle with just a little bit honey on top. This recipe, it's one of my favorite recipes. The other eggplant recipe, we take the roasted eggplant when it's really soft. We scoop all the meat out. So you let it chill, you don't want it too hot. A little bit parsley, fresno chili sliced, salt, pepper, half a tablespoon of lemon. Half a tablespoon of olive oil, teaspoon of honey, heirloom tomato on the bottom with a little bit of salt and black pepper. You mix it very well. Great salad on top. A few cubes of, of nice feta. Just a little bit drizzle of olive oil. Nice parsley. You want to put some just old bread that you have at home. You can slice brush it with a little bit extra virgin olive oil and just toast it. And that's it. Simple, fresh, tasty. Thanks for joining us in New York. Come back soon for more stories, recipes, and gardening tips from the Victory Gardens Edible Feast.